Well, good morning and welcome once again to Redeemer Baptist Church. I'm very glad that all of you are here with us today. We are especially glad, uh, Tracy and I are especially glad to have her parents with us, Ross and Deanna. We're glad that you guys are here with us in worship today. Um, we're thankful for having family in town. If you are our guest here and you haven't met me yet, my name is Chris and I do have the privilege of serving here at Redeemer as the lead pastor. I'm going to invite you to open up your copy of God's Word if you brought it with you to the book of 1 John. If you're not familiar with the Bible, you can flip towards the back, towards that last book of the Bible called Revelation, and there you will find, if you flip just a few pages over, the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It should be pretty easy to find 1st John chapter 2. You can find a Bible in the seat back in front of you, or if you are tech savvy, you can simply open up the YouVersion Bible app, hit the events function, and you should be able to pull up all of today's message notes, all of the scriptures that we're going to use, and you can even save those and take those home with you. If you prefer the analog or paper version, we have those notes for you as well, right? Okay, so we have been uh, for a few weeks in a series that we entitled Blessed Assurance, a study of the book of 1 John, where we've been arguing that John's purpose in writing the book of 1 John was to tell us as Christians how we can know that we are Christians, how we can be assured of this. And so it's always good to begin a message in this series by asking this particular question. Are you a Christian? Now maybe you came here today and you have a very strong idea of how to answer that question. You say, of course I am. And, but if I were to ask you, how do you know? How do you know? What kind of response might you give me? How could you have confidence for yourself? Maybe you are pretty confident about yourself, but you're not sure about family members or friends, uh, co-workers or neighbors. And, and if you were to ask them, how do you know that you are or aren't a Christian, what kind of answers might they give? And very commonly, we get answers like, well, I know I'm a Christian because I say I am. We are big in the 21st century on self-identifying. If I identify as something, who are you to question that I am? And that mentality has grasped into the church. People say, well, you can't question me. If I say I'm a Christian, of course I'm a Christian. But you know, the author of Christianity is a guy named Jesus Christ, and he said that on the day of judgment, many people will say to him, Lord, Lord, and he will say, I don't know you. It's not enough to self-identify. Some people say, well, you know you're a Christian because you've had some kind of religious experience. You walked an aisle, you prayed a prayer, you got baptized in a certain way in a certain church, you went through catechism or confirmation class, you're a Christian because you fulfilled certain sacraments. Uh, there's lots of religious works that people will say, that they've done. And Jesus says, you know, on the day of judgment, many of you are going to come to me and say, you cast out demons and you had all kinds of religious good works and experiences. And once again, Jesus says, I'm going to say to you, I don't know you. So it's not enough to have had some kind of experience or some kind of good works. Some people say, well, I know I'm a Christian because I have the right knowledge. I have the right beliefs. But do you know, demons know that Jesus is the Son of God and it doesn't save them. So how do you know you're a Christian? It seems like all these things that we think are ordinary tests and things that we would say, yes, this is how you know somebody's a Christian, whether it's yourself or somebody else. Those things don't really stand up to a biblical measure, a biblical test. Well, good news for you and me John wrote the book of 1 John largely to help us know what are the reasons that we can have confidence as Christians that we are Christians, or if we aren't a Christian, we can examine ourselves as Scripture commends and says, say to ourselves, you know what, I'm not sure that I am a Christian, and maybe I, that's something I want to be, or maybe it's something I'm going to reject, but at least I'm going to be honest about it. And I'm going to examine my life and see whether or not I am a Christian. Now, John has one characteristic of his teaching that if you're used to reading the books of Paul or even a lot of contemporary teaching that could be a little bit frustrating to you. We're used to going from point A to point B to point C and so on, and that's the way the Apostle Paul wrote a lot of his letters. But guess what? John didn't write that way. 
John's going to teach you a truth, and then he's going to teach it again. And he's going to teach it again, and he's going to say it a different way, and he's going to renew himself over and over again in different ways, teaching the same sets of truths. He's going to kind of picture it like a drill. He's boring into your life, and he's causing you to rethink things again and again and again. So, we're going to take a look at one of the things that John says you can test your life with to determine whether or not you're a Christian. We're going to look at that today, but we're going to look at it in four passages scattered throughout the book of 1 John, beginning with 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. John writes these words, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. John's going to come back to this theme in 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 where he says, For this message, this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. John's not done with this. He's going to come back to it again in 1 John chapter 4. So in 1 John 2, chapter 3, now in verse chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And then he's still not done. The end of chapter 4, going into chapter 5, he comes back to this theme again. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen and this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. This is the word of the Lord. So we're going to see that John's going to argue with us today. He's going to argue against our resistant minds and our resistant hearts. And he's going to say, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, there is an essential quality. And that essential quality of a Christian is, in fact, love, particularly love for your Christian brothers and sisters. So we're going to see how John makes this argument in kind of four key repeated themes. John's going to argue that love is a commandment. 
Love is also, he's going to point out, not just a commandment, it's a characteristic of Christians. It's in fact a confirmation of both our spiritual reality and our destination. And then he's going to also be pointing out how love is a costly conviction. So love is a command. Love is a characteristic, love is a confirmation, and love is a costly conviction. Let's start with this idea that love is a command. Now, right away, as soon as I said those words, some of you felt something inside you. You're like, you can't command love. You can't command love. Love is something that just happens. You just feel it. And that's what movies and love songs on the radio have told you. Over and over again, it's something that just you experience. You fall into love, right? You can't command love. So it seems silly. Either I do or don't feel love for a particular person. But listen to how John put it in 1 John chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Let's go back there. And he says to the church, notice he's writing to people that he loves. Beloved, he says, I am writing you no new commandment but an old commandment that you had from the beginning, from the beginning of your faith, you've had this commandment. The old commandment is the word that you heard. When you heard the gospel, this commandment came with it. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him, that's Jesus, true in Jesus and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Those of us that struggle with this idea that love can be commanded really struggle with Jesus. Lots of people say they're fans of Jesus Christ. They mean he's a good guy, good teacher, good prophet. But, you know, when John says that this love is an old commandment, you're struggling with God himself. Going all the way back to the time of Moses, God said to the people of Israel, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that's a command. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You're commanded to love God. And then he said, and the second is like unto it. And he quotes Leviticus 19.18. It is an old commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. As we're going to see, in fact, this is a command that God's been commanding since the time of the garden. This is an old commandment but it's a commandment that came with a new force. It is a new command because Jesus has refreshed this command. Look at John 13, and Jesus put as recorded there as saying these words, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. How are you to love other Christians, other followers of Jesus in the same way that Jesus has loved you in the same manner, depth, measure of love that you have been loved by Jesus Christ, Jesus is commanding you to love one another. Well, you say, well, I don't know if I like that too much. I mean, love is just something I feel, but this is not the consistent teaching of the church. We may easily forget it, but guess what? From the time the apostles began to spread the good news of Jesus, they did not forget to teach this command. John said in 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, he said, This is the message that you heard from the beginning. From the time we told you about the love that Jesus Christ had for you and how he came to save you from your sins, we told you you should love one another. It's a consequence of this. Now think about this. Do you think of love as essential or optional to your Christian faith? Is it an add-on? Is it the icing to the cake? Or is it the cake itself? John argues that love is not optional, and he's not alone. All the apostles, in fact, argue that love is not optional. Listen to Paul writing these words that Lorene read for us so beautifully earlier. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels... I'm Billy Graham, or Greg Laurie, or Stephen Furtick, or Craig Rochelle. I'm some great teacher in the church, but I have not love. I am a noisy gong, or a clanging cymbal. You can be the most powerful communicator of the good news, but if you don't have love, you're just empty brass. He goes on. He says, if I have all prophetic powers... 
and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. I've got all the Bible learning in the world. I'm like Dr. Al Mohler with a personal library of 30,000 volumes that I've read and can cite. And if you believe it all, if you have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but you have not love, Paul says, I am nothing. Now, he goes on. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned, I'm ready to be a martyr for Jesus' sake, but I have not love. I gain nothing. Is love essential or is it optional? John's arguing that this command to love is a consequential command. It's founded upon a new reality. He's saying, listen, Christian, if you understand what happens in the moment that you encounter the good news of Jesus and it became real to you, it is a consequence of the fact that darkness is passing away, the true light is already shining. God has sent His Son into the world and He's ordained a new kingdom, a kingdom of love. And if you believe this, then you see that love is a consequential necessity for everyone who has real faith in Jesus Christ. John's going to make this point time and again. Look at 1 John 3.23. He says, this is his commandment. This is the commandment of God that we believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another. How do you know you're a Christian? Well, I believe on Jesus. Good. Do you love your fellow believers? They're paired commandments. Did you see that? Just as He commanded us. This is what Jesus taught. Jesus didn't say, believe in me and decide whether or not you like the guy next to you. One's essential, the other one's not. That's not the way it goes. He's saying, if you don't love the person that's next to you, there's an issue with you believing in me. Love is a consequential necessity. In fact, if you're going to say you love God... I've met people throughout my experience as a pastor, they say, oh, I love God. And other people in the church may say, oh, this person, they're such a great Christian, they have such great understanding. And yet you look at their life and they are not loving people. They are not. And John says this, he says, this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God, listen to this, must also love his brother. If you say you love God, a consequential necessity of that is that you must love that person that is sitting two rows behind you who's irritating you right now. So, have you felt the weight of this command? I mean, really. That's a great question, right? Do I really see this as a real command? Do you see, another way to ask is, do you see a failure to love your brothers and sisters in Christ as sin or as unbelief? Here's a way to really check your heart. You go to bed at night. And what are you thinking about as you evaluate your day? Do you think about all the things you accomplished or all the things that got frustrated and you didn't get accomplished? As you think about those things, have you ever asked yourself, did I love people today? I mean, if Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is to love your neighbor yourself, shouldn't that be the evaluation a Christian should end their day with? Did I love God and did I love other people? See, I don't know if you're like me or not. I'm a real task-oriented person, and so I value my life. I got, I got checklists on checklists. Those of you that work with me in the offices know this. I have, I have computer programs that run checklists for me. Okay? I mean, that, I love this. And I, and I feel so good at the end of the day if I got through the checklist. And I feel less good if I didn't get through the checklist. But you know what's never been on my checklist? But maybe I ought to put it there. Did you love people today, Chris? What if I put that at the top of the checklist? Maybe then I would begin to really grapple with the weight of this command. So love is a command, but John's not going to say it's just a command. He's not, he's not, he's not 
willing to leave us there. He's going to say, love is not just a command, it's a characteristic of all Christians. One way you can see this is you're going to see how John tries to build a contrast between Christians and non-Christians. And he's going to say, guess what? For non-Christians, hatred is characteristic of unbelievers. Immediately, some of us are going to be offended by this. We're going to say, guess what? I don't think that's true. I, I know lots of people who don't claim to follow Christ, and they're very nice people. They're very loving people. But this is how Scripture describes Everyone who doesn't love Jesus. Paul, writing about his own religious, good works-based life before he came to Christ, said this, We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. The reason you and I don't think of ourselves that way before we came to Christ, or maybe today if you aren't sure where you stand in relationship to Christ, the reason you don't think of that is you and I believe a lie. We believe that there is such a thing as a neutral action. We believe that there is such a thing as a neutral action. We believe that we can choose between loving people, and maybe there's a few people out there we kind of sort of hate, especially if they're a part of a a brown-skinned people group somewhere that we think is trying to blow us up. It's okay to hate them. Or people who vote differently from us. There's somebody out there we think it's okay to hate, but then there's the majority of our actions, and we don't think that they fall into line with either love or hate. But you know we're lying to ourselves. The Bible says that everything that doesn't flow from faith in God is a sin. And faith in God, as we have already seen, always has a love reality to it. That means that every action that I do that isn't done out of love to God and for other people is in fact an act of selfish, self-centered hatred. It means that we love ourselves more than we love other people. And John's going to double down on this reality. He's going to say that hatred and contempt for people and despising people or just not caring about them, just saying literally in our minds, you know, you can suffer, go to hell. I don't care. All of those things are different forms of murder. Listen to how he contrasts Believers who live a life of love with those who aren't believers. He says, we should not be like Cain. Who was Cain? The first murderer, right? Who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. It wasn't just that he was doing bad things. It's that Abel was doing that which was pleasing to God. And Cain didn't have that as his focus. Well, you know, everybody who doesn't believe in God is focused on pleasing something, and that's usually themselves or even trying to be a good person so that they don't need God. He's going to go on in 1 John 3.15. John's going to say, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Who's he echoing here? Isn't that Jesus? Remember, Jesus said, if you call your brother a fool, you're in danger of going to hell. Having contempt for people in your heart is, in fact, enough to damn you forever. You know that no murderer, John says, has eternal life abiding in him. Despising, hating, looking down on people, thinking you're superior to them. Guess what? What if those things are, in fact, what Scripture says, indicators and evidence of who our true spiritual Lord is? One of the lies we believe ourselves is that I'm Lord of my actions. But the Bible says, no, that doesn't work that way. You don't understand. There's only two real dominant lords in your life. One is God, and the other one is your spiritual father, Satan. John's going to put it this way in 1 John 3.10. By this, it is evident. Notice, here's the evidence. If somebody's presenting an indictment, this is what they say. Here's the evidence. Who are the children of God? And who are the children of the devil? Notice he doesn't give their middle category there, right? You're either one or the other. You're either a child of God or a child of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness, that means being in right relationship with right intention to God, is not of God, 
nor is the one who does not love his brother. What if every time you and I do an unloving action or fail to love somebody, what if we're proving that our Lord isn't Jesus Christ, but Satan? Now, John's going to say, if hatred is characteristic of an unbeliever, love is characteristic of real Christians because real Christians, you and I, who, those of us who say, yes, this is my, my reality, guess what? You've been gifted with love in you as a result of a new birth relationship with God. Time and again, John's going to make this part of that theme. Go to 1 John 4, 7. He says, Beloved, let us love one another. Why? For love is from God. Where do you get love? You get it from God. You don't come up with it yourself. It comes from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. There is no love outside of a gift from God. Did you see that? Whoever loves has been born of God. All earthly forms of love are inauthentic shallow shadows you want to really love somebody you have to have been born of God and know him he's going to go on 1 John chapter 5 verses 1 through 2 everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ Jesus is the answer to everything you've ever been longing for that's what it means by Christ he's the fulfillment of every promise and hope he's the way that you can have a right relationship with God everyone who believes that has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. Stop. Did you catch that? If you say you love God, you love His children. Imagine somebody comes to you and they say, you know what, I really like you, but your kids, I can't stand. Your kids annoy me. That's what we do every day, isn't it? We go to God and we complain about our fellow believers. Well, sometimes we go to God and mostly we just go to our other fellow believers and say, can you believe? Or maybe we just keep it inside, but we are so prideful and contemptuous and looking down and we say to ourselves things like, I would never do that. Yeah, and they're looking at you saying the same thing. Whoever loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. Why? Why is love characteristic of Christians? Because what if the God who's called you into a new life, a new relationship with Him, what if He actually is love? You know how rare that is? For the Bible to describe God in these single terms, we, we have words like, God is holy, different, unique from us. He's not anything that we would come up with. God is light. John already said that in 1 John. It means, and, and he, John goes on to explain, in him is no darkness at all. God is absolutely the one who is always determining what is right and wrong. But here, here in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, John is going to say that God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God. Why? Because God is love. You can't know God. Be in an intimate relationship with Him and not love. Oh. So what's characteristic of your life? If people looked at your life, would they say that your life is characterized by hatred? Oh, that's such a strong word. Maybe contempt? Despising? In fact, maybe you've got friendships with people because you despise the same people. Those of you there on Facebook or other social media, do all the people you like or follow or retweet, do they hate the same things you hate? the same people you hate? Do they have the same contempt? See, we love to get together with people that hate the same way we do. Would people look at you and say, man, that person, it doesn't matter. They love people who are smarter than them or more beautiful or 
dumber or uglier. They love people that don't act like them, that hate their favorite sport. They love people that voted for the other candidate. Do you love the church and all of her imperfect saints? Would people say the characteristic of this person's life is that? If you got to the end of your life, can you imagine a better obituary than somebody saying, when I think of this person, this sister in Christ, all I can think of is the word love, not simply because they loved me, but because she loved all the people I couldn't stand. So love is a command, and it is a characteristic. But we need to recognize that John's going to double down again, and he's going to say, love is a confirmation of both our spiritual condition and our spiritual destiny. Some of us need to be honest here this morning. That no matter what we've claimed all our lives, guess what? We are proving out that we are not actually followers of Jesus Christ. We are doing this by our lack of love. And you know how John's going to describe us? He's going to say that if that's true of us, we remain in darkness, unaware of our spiritual condition. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9. Whoever says he is in the light, remember God is light. If you say you're in God and you hate your brother, guess what? You're still in darkness. Oh, verse 11. Whoever hates his brother is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and doesn't know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Have you ever tried to feel your way through a dark house in the middle of the night? The world is full of people who think they know where they are going in the dark, but who are stubbing their toes against the reality of the love of God. We lie about our spiritual reality. See, some of us need to just get real honest and say we've been telling falsehoods to ourselves and to the world Some of us have been doing it on behalf of other people. We don't want to picture our friends, our families, our neighbors, our grandchildren going to hell, but they are hell-bound because they have a spiritual destiny of death. And if you look at their life, one indicator of it is that they have no love for the people of God. They're lying to themselves, and we lie to ourselves about the spiritual reality of other people. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If anyone says, oh yeah, I love God. Can you hear this like in contemporary valley girl terminology? Oh yeah, Jesus is my fave. Jesus is my fave. And hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Stop lying about the spiritual reality of your friends, your families, your co-workers, your neighbors. If they don't love the people of God, you have a very good reason to believe they are not saved. John's going to go even farther. He's going to say these words. If that's who you are, guess what? If you do not love, you abide in death. That's John's code for being damned forever. Some of us are demonstrating imperfectly the genuineness of our faith through the practice of love. How does that happen? Well, it happens because we've experienced the love of God. See, some of you listening to this message right now, you've heard the first part. You say, love is a command, it's a characteristic, so I'm going to go home and I'm going to muster love. I'm going to force myself next week, I'm going to find that person who stinks and I'm going to sit next to him in church. That's my love lesson. But see, the Christian loves because they have experienced a love that is more profound than anything anybody could muster on their own. John says this in 1 John 4, 19, We love because 
He first loved us. See, love isn't something you can come up with on your own. It has a transformation that God has to ride and, and carve into your heart. You love because God has loved you in a way more profoundly than you could have ever imagined or dreamed. Christian, you can have a confirmation of your spiritual destiny because you rest in the light of God's gracious love to you and therefore you have daily spiritual direction for your life. You're not walking in darkness. Look at 1 John 2.10. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light. If you don't love, you abide in death. But if you do love, you abide or rest in the light. You're in the light. You know what to do. In him... There is no cause for stumbling. You're not stumbling around in the light of Jesus Christ because you have a default question that always comes to your mind and is in your heart. You, I don't know what to do. Do the loving thing. That's it. Do the thing that would be demonstrative of the love that you have received from Jesus Christ. It's a confirmation as you have this love coming up in you, you have an assurance that you can live both now and forever. 1 John 3.14 We know that we have passed out of death into life. How do I know this? How can I know that I have an eternal security? Because I love the brothers. Oh, I love the brothers genuinely. Do you have to work at it? Well, sometimes, but guess what? That person that I would never choose to spend time with, they're my most precious brother and sister in Christ because they've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said that this love is the sign of the authenticity of our discipleship. Jesus put it this way, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, don't get me wrong, love for the lost, a love for the hurting, a love for the needy, all these things certainly are encompassed in this teaching of John, but he's eager to say, first, you must love the church. And Jesus has said it. By this the world will know, do you love those that have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ? So here's the question, what is your life confirming about your spiritual reality? What is your life confirming about your spiritual reality. So John has taught us that love is a command, love is a characteristic, and love is a confirmation. He's also going to say it's a costly conviction. It's a costly conviction. Love always initiates. It's a choice. When I say it's a conviction, I mean that it's a force that comes upon you out of a reality that you have experienced through the love of God and through that you are going to have a new choice being birthed and carved into your heart to set your affection upon the temporarily unlovely. Why? Why would I say that love always initiates? And one way to check your love and see whether or not it's real is to ask yourself, do you love people that don't love God? You. You ever met a couple that falls in love? The affection builds, right? Oh, she thinks I'm pretty. Oh, she thinks I'm great. Oh, he thinks I'm so smart. And we start to build this affection. And oh, I just, I, I find him so fascinating. I find her so amazing. And they start to build this. And guess what? It's really great. But what happens if one person doesn't love you? in that one relationship? What if the other says, no, I don't, I don't feel that? You, you can out of, an, out of an obsession, out of an adolescent sort of immature, uh, you know, kind of focus, hyper-focus on somebody, you can convince yourself for a while that you love them. But most of us, honestly, for real love, the truth is it's just a big ego trip. But what if, what if love isn't supposed to have that nature? What if love always initiates and goes to people that are unlovely, at least even in a moment, and says, I'm going to love you at your ugliest? When I'm doing premarital counseling with couples, one of the questions I ask them is, not how do you feel about each other today, but what are you going to feel like when cancer eats away her body that you think is so beautiful right now? 
What choice are you going to make in loving this person when he loses that job and has no prospects? See, you begin to love the unlovely, and guess what? Why do I know that this is true of the church? Because John reminds us that this is the love that God has for us. It's an initiating love. It's a love that God came to us with and he set his love on us while we were unlovely. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. In this is love. John says, you want to see a picture of love? Here it is. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. Stop. There is a lie in the contemporary church that says this, that Jesus loves me because I loved him. That is not Christianity. John says, you didn't love God. He loved you while you hated him. Paul's going to say we were enemies of Christ, alienated and hostile to him. And he came to us while we were his enemies and while we were in our sin and while we hated him and while we were pushing away and while we were in the ugliness of our depravity and our degradation. And God said, I'm going to love you. I'm going to set my affection upon you. I'm going to choose to initiate a love relationship with you. How? He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The word propitiation means a appeasement, a wrath bearer. God's going to send his perfect son to live a perfect life that we could not have lived, to die a death that we could not die, and there on the cross of Calvary to bear not simply temporary punishment like having a crown of thorns pushed upon his head, being scourged in his back, being sped upon and mocked and stripped naked, not just those things, but at the cross to bear the wrath of God, the eternal damnation that was due you and me. God poured it out on his son who did did not deserve anything because he's lived a sinless life. That's propitiation. So that you and I can be made right with God. You want to know what love looks like? Look to Calvary. It's a love that initiates. And you and I weren't even born when that happened. Don't tell me that God loved you because you loved Him. 2,000 years before you were born, God set His love upon you. He set His love upon you. And said, I will come down in time and place and history and I will have my son shed his perfect blood for people named Bev and Corliss and Jan and Bill and Jim and Nick. Love always initiates. It's a choice. Beloved, God, John goes on to say, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If God loved you with an initiating love, you and I must love with an initiating love. So here's a real quick question for you. Who is very unlovely to you right now and what are you going to do about it? Who are you going to go to that is so unlovely to you right now? Maybe they call themselves your enemy. Who are you going to go to and set your love upon? You say, well, they don't deserve it. That's the point. That's the point. You and I didn't deserve it. Love not only initiates, it always serves, and it serves from an open and therefore vulnerable heart. John argues with the church. He says, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, you, you've got material possessions, you see your fellow brother or sister in need of material possessions. By the way, this would apply to areas other than material. You, you have energy, but your brother or sister is tired, weak, and hurting. You've got, you've got a, a spiritual gift that they don't have, but you're refusing to use it. You're holding out, waiting, stingy. John says, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Love always serves from an open heart. Love looks and says, how can I give my life away? I've been loved with a Savior who didn't give me a stingy portion of His love. He gave me everything. How could I not give everything for unlovely people? And yes, guess what? Notice the phrase closes his heart. 
Some of us have built up defensive walls. We're like, you know what? I'll love you when you love me first. I'll be nice to you when you're nice to me first. I'm going to defend myself. I'm going to make sure my heart stays nice and safe unless C.S. Lewis says, you know what? When we close up our hearts like that, our hearts begin to shrivel and wither and die. The only way to love people is to risk it all with an open heart to be vulnerable because love not only must initiate and not only must serve, it must always act. Little children, let us not love in word or talk. Don't simply have a good feeling towards somebody and call it love. Don't simply have a good idea, a fandom of somebody. Oh, I just love him. Really, what have you done to show that love? Love acts. Because John says, not only love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth, in authenticity. I'm going to tell you that love is always most completely expressed in action. When I say this, don't confuse me with saying uh, love is an action. Love is more than an action. It's a setting of an affection. John's already said, or P, uh, Paul has already taught us that if we love somebody but, or do all these things that seem like they're loving but we don't actually have love for them, it's not real love. So love's more than an action. But love is most completely expressed in action. What if I told you that passivity is the enemy of love? Sitting back and waiting. You know how many people call themselves Christians? But they don't love the church with any kind of active love. They're sitting back waiting. Yeah, I'll wait and see. I'm going to wait and see if somebody gives me something. Do I like the sermon? What do I think about the music? You know what? They messed up on those slides. I can't believe it. I'm going to sit back here and I'm going to judge. You know what I did all week long for the church? Nothing. Oh, is that love? Is that love? That's just one illustration. My brothers, my sisters, that's a very real thing where the church is waiting for other people to serve them. Come ask me. Make much of me. No! Love is never passive. Love always acts. Having a mere good opinion or feelings or intentions towards somebody is not love. Why? Because love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Church, do you hear that line? I don't know if I like that music. Who cares? Next time I hear that, I'm going to say, love does not insist on its own way. Do you read that? It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I heard this wonderful Australian preacher, some of you have heard me use this illustration before, talking about how he was preaching and he got to the point in a message where he said to his church, he said, you know what nobody has ever said to me? They've never come to me after a church service and said, I hate that particular song that we sang. Let's sing it again next week because my brother next to me loves it. But do you see how one is an action of love? And the other isn't. So love acts in very practical and real ways. I use those things just to ask you, are you loving people in a way that acts? And love always sacrifices. 1 John 3.16, I know Nick mentioned this in his message, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. You want to know what love is? Look to what Jesus did. He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So would somebody look at your life and say, every day, day in, day out, this person is dying to self because they love their brothers and sisters in Christ. They're not looking for ways to get their rights, their preferences. They're looking for ways to die to their rights and their preferences. Are you saying to yourself, who cares what I want? I want everyone else to know and experience the love of Jesus Christ. What does your love cost you? 
What does your love for the church actually cost you? Do you ask yourself that question? Simply, you see a problem in a believer's life, and maybe you see a weakness or an imperfection or a sin habit. Have you spent an hour, one hour of your life in prayer? Oh, no, Wheel of Fortune's on TV. I can't possibly give up an hour of prayer, or an hour of TV for an hour of prayer. Has love cost you a difficult discipleship conversation? Have you ever had to put your arm around a brother or sister in Christ and said, listen, I get it. You're struggling. I've also struggled. Let me walk alongside you and help you become more like Jesus. Maybe somebody doesn't have a clear understanding of the gospel and has your love cost you that embarrassing, awkward moment of having to say to them, let me share with you the good news of Jesus again and tell you how much he's loved you. What does it cost you? Has it cost you forgiveness? Oh, forgiveness is always a payment, isn't it? Especially when somebody hasn't asked for forgiveness. I'll forgive them when they ask me. And then they do ask you, you know what? It's not enough. Because what you don't want is to forgive them. You want them to pay. But that is not the love that Jesus gave you, is it? He didn't ask you to pay for your sins. He paid for them. Has your love cost you an act of service? World War II, Ernst Gordon was a, group, uh, was a member of a group of British internees in a Japanese prison camp along the River Kwai. Some of you may have seen the, the more comedic version, Bridge Over River Kwai, but it was terrible to be in those camps. Hundreds of thousands of internees, both nationals, British, uh, Malays, New Zealanders, they died in those camps. It was horrific conditions. And Ernst survived those camps, and he tells the story of a particular day in the camp when all the British, New Zealand, Canadian, and Australian troops were lined up. They had been working on the railroad all day long. And they came back to camp, and they're standing there exhausted after dozens of hours of work, and they're just covered in mud and filth, and they're standing in formation while they're being berated by their Japanese guards, and they're counting out all of the, the uh, tools they use for building the railroad. And they came up a shovel short. And this guard believed that one of them had stolen the shovel. And he began to scream at the group, insisting that whoever had taken the shovel come forward. None of the men stood forward. They all stood there at military attention. And the guard went more and more berserk. Rage took over him and he pulled out his gun and had all the other soldiers surrounding them pull out their weapons. And they pointed and he started screaming, All die! All die! All die! One soldier stood forth. And there in front of his comrades, they beat him to death. As an example. When the formation was dismissed, there was a recount and not one shovel was missing. Do you understand what that man chose? In a very real way, he said, I will lay down my life for a crime I did not commit. Now that is a small picture of what Jesus has done for us, but you and I we won't even give up our preferences, our time, our financial resources for our brothers and sisters in Christ because it's mine. And I want you to see that that is so antithetical to the reality of the gospel because love must always sacrifice. And finally, my brothers, my sisters, love will always be a fulfillment. Some of you are empty and you are hurting and I get it, you've been beat up by life. Others of you are just full of your own selfishness, your own agendas, but you've been out there looking for something to satisfy you. What if I told you both groups that what you've actually been looking for is love? A love that would actually satisfy you. And what if I told you that's not just a love that you get, 
but it's a love that fulfills you as you practice it. What if it's a love that God gives you, fills your life with through His Son, Jesus Christ, as He comes to abide in you and dwell in you and fill you with the reality of love? What if it's a love that doesn't just stay there as a stagnant level pool, but it bubbles up and overflows out of your life into the lives of others? This is the love that John is portraying. It's a love that we practice as we experience the reality of God's indwelling love in us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 12, No one has ever seen God if we love one another. God abides in us. What if that hole in your life is God-sized, as Blaise Pascal said? What if God is wanting to fill your life with that love? That's an offer if you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you never believe that His love is what could actually satisfy you. My brothers, my sisters, I tell you today, it is enough. It is enough. Believe on Him. Trust in His love. Believe it is the love that can finally satisfy you. And maybe you've not been changed by that love, but today I'm going to tell you, you are so empty. You're striving. You're trying to get your way. You're trying to fix your own problems. What if you're supposed to be resting in God's love and loving other people? Because it goes on to say, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. That term perfected may not be the best translation. It really should be the brought to complete fulfillment. What if God's love is brought to complete fulfillment in us? as we live out and practice the reality of the love of Jesus Christ, what if we don't get less love? What if we don't run out, but the more we pour it out, the more it comes in to us? And I want to tell you, that is the love that Jesus alone can give. So let's pray. Let's pray and ask for that. Father God, would you... As we, oh, we're, we're bowing our hearts here right now before your word and we're asking God that, that some of us need to hear the weight of this commandment come upon us and we need to be reminded that love is not optional. We need to be convicted that without it, that, that we're demonstrating our spiritual reality. We need that confirmation that we aren't following you. Maybe today we need to believe on you and trust in your love for us the gift of your son Jesus, a death that we could not have died and a life we could not live without him. Some of us need to have our spiritual lives renewed, our, our love tanks refilled, and we need to look again to the cross and be filled anew with the love that you have had for us so that our lives do reflect that, so that we sacrifice and initiate and act and place a costly love out there. And we'll find that, that we don't run out of love, but we're even given more love. Oh God, would you do such a work in us today? Would you change us? Make it the characteristic of our lives. By your grace, for your glory, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.